Sarah, now, now it's about you. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to do a quick intro on Sarah because she's very humble. So she's probably just going to say I'm from Maine and I have two kids and some other things, but I think there's, there's a lot to be said about Sarah. She's, as I mentioned, she's the global CEO of Droga5. Um, she's been there since 2008. Um, she did grow up in a tiny town in Western Maine. Um, before Droga, she worked at the likes of Goodby. She was at BBH for almost nine years, which is where I worked for her and had such an amazing experience. She was an incredible mentor to me and was a huge catalyst to my career. Um, under her leadership at Droga, the achievements have been nothing short of remarkable. Um, you know, she, Droga was the Ad Week Agency of the Decade. Uh, they won the Ad Age Agency or A-List, or they were part of the A-List eight times over the last, I think, 10 or, 10 or 12 years. They were the five-time Creative Agency of the Year, and they were also Fast Company's world's most innovative companies um, over um, three times as well. Um, she's an amazing person, a great mother to her kids, Hayden and Elk. And as I said, was a great mentor to me. So thank you again for being here. And uh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and then also we encourage you know people to ask their own questions in the Q and A, and then towards the end we'll we'll get to some of those as well. But as you were my you know previous boss, the first question is going to be, what is the best piece of advice you've received by a boss in your career? Um, first of all, thank you um, for having me, Andy. Um, always a pleasure to see you, to talk to you, and I'm not at all surprised and that you've done your own thing and how well you're doing, and it's nice to talk to people in Denver. What a wonderful place. Um, so best piece of advice, I've, I've been asked this a few times, you know, over the course of my career. And I think um, the best advice has come at different points. So I don't have one piece of advice. So I probably have a couple that really resonated with me. Um, the first was something that I know um, I said to you early on, you know, in, in your career, um, because we definitely have a lot of similarities and style. And that was from... Um, well a man called, um, sorry, I just had a weird breakup, a man called uh, John Elder, who um, is now president or CEO of Heat, but he was an account lead at Goodby back in the day when I was there in the 90s, just to, you know, completely date myself. And, you know, he was, um, his suggestion to me from a stylistic perspective is that I need to believe my own bullshit a little bit more. And at the time I thought to myself, does that mean be superficial or fake, which is just, you know, just not some, a place that I wanted to go. And that wasn't what he was saying. It was just that I needed to believe in myself, you know, believe in my own narrative, believe in my own style. And I really, you know, took that to heart versus waiting for other people to define me, which I think is, is really, really important. Um, the other piece of advice that resonated for me in my career, um, you know, which I've been in this business for a long time now, um, was when I had my son, who's now 15, and I came back to work at BBH, and I was speaking to Emma Cookson, who was the chief strategy officer at the time, a real force of nature, a little bit intimidating in the most positive way, and and her advice to me, trying to manage everything around being a mom, being a woman, trying to move up in a leadership role was, there's gonna be certain things that you just never do again, and you're not good at, and you have to let that go if you really wanna kind of balance your life a bit. And then there's gonna be things that you're better at. And you know, I could write a book about this. There are certain things when my you know, priority shifted that I became much, much better at um, when I became a parent than I was as a, a single person from how I gave feedback to how I led to how I pushed to, you know, where I spent my um, energy and emotion. And there are certain things that I just never did. I don't think I've written a to-do list, you know, in 15 years, just purely based on, you know, um, uh, time management and focus and I'm less prepared for meetings and I become much more comfortable doing things on the fly and much more comfortable with mistakes um, and, and, you know, to some extent, failures. So I think those were probably um, two pieces of advice that I, that really resonated. I've had other great pieces of advice I could get into, but those were two that resonated and perhaps I needed them at the time. Great. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, and I guess, you know, the other thing I'd, I'd love to get your perspective on is what advice would you give your younger self? Like if you look back on your mm -hmm. career and, you know, there's so many times in your life where you look at it and you're like, if I only knew, you know, then what I know now and the perspective I have, is there any, any advice you'd give to your younger self? Yeah, this is going to sound like such an old person advice, <laughs> but you know, here, but here it goes. And I really believe it. I think there were things I put a lot of emotion and a lot of time um, and in many different kind of eras, it was my priority into my career, um, into my belief in what I was trying to create at Droga. I look back at things that I really worried about and stressed about that really didn't matter. They were, you know, kind of mere bumps in the road, you know, um, I recently said to someone, something didn't work out, even though we gave it like the absolute best go. And sometimes you just have to kind of emotionally let go and say, well, that's one less meeting I have to go to, you know, um, things that you, you can really, especially in the pace of this world and everything that's going on, you can get quite anxious um, and worried about a lot of different things from a business perspective. And I think to my younger self, I would say, keep some perspective you know, there's six good things going on. If there's three things that are very difficult, like that's a win. And, you know, it's, it's just about how you manage through the difficulties. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always think that the things you worry about with foresight typically aren't the issues that in hindsight that are the issues, you know, there's something yeah. else. So yeah, it's not worth sort of stressing about some of those things. Um, and mm -hmm. obviously as, as a, a woman leader, any advice for women in advertising? And any, you know, yeah, suggestions or things they should think about? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, and in a really positive way, you know, I look at the female leaders below me, you know, at all different levels and there's nothing that gives me, you know, more excitement or hope in the way they sort of handle themselves across the board. Um, but I think there's lots of advice I could give. I think the first thing would be, um, as a woman, sometimes this is a bit of a generalization, so bear with me, but sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to tell people what you want um, and get comfortable with that. And don't assume that your boss, male or female, um, necessarily knows exactly what you want. Um, but don't be afraid to ask for things. Um, you may hear that you're not ready, but really be clear, you know, this is what I aspire to, this is what I want. Um, the other thing is a little bit, you know, difficult to explain, but I would say, don't you define who you are and where you want to go. Don't let other people define it for you. So I like to say that I kind of floundered in my mid thirties and mid-level management. Um, and I was a little bit afraid to kind of take the next step. I did not perceive myself as, a CEO. I don't think I ever said, you know, even when I was in the role that I wanted to be CEO, I was slightly uncomfortable um, with that notion. So I think I often um, took feedback about my style, which was not like a, you know, days gone by male command and control type of style that I let other people kind of define what I was good at. Um, and it took me, you know, probably, um, I would say I'm a late bloomer until early 40s or, you know, maybe even late 30s, really, until I went to Droga and, you know, had to kind of find my own path to um, really be comfortable saying like, no, this is what I want. You know, I want to lead. I'm a great leader. I want to be in charge. Um, I don't have some of these shortcomings. And if I do, I can make them, you know, into a positive. I, I think a lot of women probably take too much feedback like decide what you want you can do anything um and and just go about getting it great amazing yeah and i was thinking about the other day i mean just so many of the amazing leaders that came out of bbh you know kirsten flanick who's running bbdo and um aaron riley who's running shite so yeah it's been a great mm -hmm. legacy of um some amazing leaders going on yeah great things. yeah yeah um, Cool. And how, how do you see the industry changing, you know, for worse, for better? You know, what's your perspective on, on where the industry is going? Um, yeah, I think it's complicated. I, I personally, um, and maybe I have to, maybe we all have to think this way, but I think it's actually really positive. Um, 
is I think clients, you know, people talk about this, they expect more than ever. The bar is really high, but if you believe in your thinking and your people and what you can do, I think there's an opportunity for advertising agencies to be so much more than traditional advertisers. Like we can really affect everything, the whole experience, product development, you know, our thinking, I find at least we really have a seat at the table um, right at the top of the C-suite. Um, and you know, that's not, not just us. I think if the caliber of your thinking is that strong, you have that seat and clients brand matters more than anything right now. And I think clients really want us to be a true business partner, not just cranking out campaign ads. So it's a higher bar. There's more pressure on ROI, right? We all, we all know that there's more project work, which doesn't matter if you believe in, you know, the quality of your thinking, your people, the results and what you're doing you know, I think the, the financials work out. So um, I think it's a good push. You know, the expectation being higher is, is a really positive thing. There are, there are broader, bigger canvases for our creative thinking than ever before. Um, and where I don't believe we have to be pigeonholed, which um, is a good thing. So, you know, it's changing a lot. People, it, lots of agencies are doing really interesting things. Um, and it's, not easy, but it never was, <laughs> but it's exciting, I think. Yeah. Right. And so obviously, I think uh, my guess is what, in the last 18 months, you or maybe it's two years now, uh, Accenture acquired Droga 5. Love mm -hmm. to, you know, better understand the impact that's had on the agency and, and actually, yeah, yeah, that relationship between the two entities, how you work together, that sort of thing. Yeah, so it'll be two years in April. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we talked to them and worked with them for a couple years before that. So it didn't feel that new, especially to me. Um, it's definitely different. It's two different cultures. But, you know, I have to say it's been really positive. Um, you know, we're probably we're working about four or five different things together. And we're, we do such different things that I think there's such like deep, respect and um, complementary like ability. So, you know, we're able to do things on clients that, you know, to some respect, I didn't even know <laughs> needed to be done. You know, it could be anything from, we need to set this up and we need, need an outsourcing, you know, tech partner to do this. We need to create something at scale. We need to, you know, motivate and create something in, you know, a certain part of Africa because they, do so much um, from a bit and have such deep business understanding and expertise and tech, it's very complimentary, but they're not brand and creative as we are. So um, they're very, very respectful of what we do and give us a lot of space. I mean, the challenge is just, you know, managing the opportunity and knowing what's right. I think for both of us, I mean, they would have us involved in lots of things, which is awesome. You can't complain about that, but just managing the cadence and pace and where we can add value and, and us understanding, you know, what the depth of what they can do. So um, they've made a very conscious effort to allow us to be Droga 5 and maintain our culture. Um, so yeah, we're just able to do more, you know, we're talking about global expansion um, because there's a need and they have a need in certain markets that we can come into. Um, so it's created a great deal more work, <laughs> um, but in a positive way. And the challenge is just managing that cadence. And you so know. you're, you know, Droga 5 is sort of a micro network, right? You have offices in London, I mm -hmm. think Sydney, if I'm not mistaken. No Sydney, oh, no. no Sydney. Okay. It, yeah. Yeah. It's New York and London, and then we're looking at what other um, developing markets we want to be in. So um, yeah, I, you know, I'd love to better understand, um, you know, how yeah, how that integration between um, London and New York works, and then how often do you work with other Accenture-owned agencies and partner with them? So on the London New York, we work together a lot. Um, I think we're really close. Uh, you know, that London's a hard market to crack and they finally cracked it and they have really good momentum. So, you know, we share pieces of business with there's things that, you know, you're non-competed out, but maybe they, you know, the client wants to work with our London team. We, we work that way. So we're very, you know, I, I talk to the leadership there 
um, Bill Scott, who's also XBBH, <laughs> um, you know, once a week and just talk about, you know, what they're doing. Um, they've really like got their own brand and kind of creative momentum right now. Um, but it's a very supportive relationship. I think, you know, it, it, for them, it's, you know, hard to come into like the Droga 5 New York shadow, um, but they really hit their stride now. But at the same time, they have the support from all of us because it's better for us. You know, they were Ad Week's International Agency of the Year. That's great for us, you know, as we're, as we're pushing more global opportunities. Um, but I, I, I think it's a situation where it's never been like competitive or we can't support you on X because we don't have enough resources. It's always been, how do we support you? You know, I think there's a, a, a friendship you know, which I, I think makes a, a big difference and it's all one PL. So, you know, they win, we win. Um, as far as the other Accenture agencies, um, they have a lot of agencies that are complementary in North America from a CRM perspective. They're integrated in some of our bigger account teams as well as um, some B2B agencies um, and some, you know, new agencies that do volume uh, production and that type of thing that, and um, Fjord, which is a very good design agency and, and more agencies in different markets that um, we're starting to work with more and more. And it really depends on the opportunity. And we've made a pretty big effort that, you know, every two weeks, all of the agencies yeah. talk and connect and share. Yeah, I think you have to make that investment. And again, with Accenture, it's so wide. The challenge is really understanding all the capabilities. I mean, they own a, a design production company that does, um, you know, works on the Game of Thrones dragons. Like they have like so many um, different capabilities that it's really navigating through. And once you work with someone, you know, it starts to, it's almost like old school word of mouth. Oh, you should bring that group in. They yeah. would be good at that. But there's a ton we just do droga, you know? Yeah. Great. Um, I'm going to, go to a question um, from the Q&A um, and, and I encourage others to, if they have questions, please um, submit them. But this is from the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design and um, Stephen Begletter, I hope I pr pronounced that correctly, is a professor there and he said, my class is listening and was wondering if you could give them any advice as far as breaking into the world of advertising. Definitely. Um, so I think, as far as breaking in, you know, it comes down to kind of resilience. You know, I had no contacts when I got out of college, as Andy said, from my small town in, in Maine, no internships. Not that I would say don't do internships. Um, internships are a good thing. But, you know, I just knew I wanted to be in advertising and I was quite, and I loved it. And I was quite um, relentless about reaching out to agencies. You know, wherever you are, there is probably a really good agency. Um, if you can get an internship, even better, because you can start to see like what part of advertising you want to be in. I thought I wanted to be a copywriter and I'm like a terrible writer. So I don't know why I thought I wanted to be a copywriter. And if you had told me I would be great and a great account leader, I would have thought that had to do with math. <laughs> so, you know, I think um, any type of internships you can do, um, talking to people to understanding in the industry. I think people always wanna support um, and help people um, getting into the business. I talk to people all the time, um, I think is really important. And then once you're in, it just, you know, to me at least, it comes down to hard work. You know, you're starting at the bottom, but really taking it all in, asking for more and, you know, it doesn't, to me at least, it doesn't matter if someone is um, an English major or an advertising major, you know, what, whatever it may be. Um, if it's, you know, art and design, you probably need to build a spec book and, you know, really find some mentors um, is just people who are curious. You know, I, I think the great thing about this industry is it's all different types of minds. There's introverts and extra extroverts. There's you know, people who, whose minds think in a certain way, um, there's space for everyone. You know, it's not one type of person, but I, don't underestimate how much people want to support and help and talk to people and be mentors for people in the business once you can, you know, worm your way into some connections. Great. You know, a couple of things I would just add. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think being a sponge 
in of around advertising, all forms of advertising. I mean, I think, you know, when I, right out of college, I was reading David Ogilvy books and all the, you know, Bill Birnbach. And mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, really being an absolute sponge in advertising, asking the right questions, how do you stand out um, from other candidates? Um, and then I, I think that is really important, like that notion of when you're in there, you know, making that moment count. I mean, hopefully finding a place that's a meritocracy that gives you more opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, when you prove that you can do it and finding, yeah, like-minded mentors that you know you can learn from. I mean, I think it was yeah. for me, at BBH, like I saw, I could learn for so much from Sarah. And so I really sought that out. So, yeah. And people want to do that. You know, I, I, they want to, you know, um, Andy mentioned some people from BBH. I mean, Erin, I still talk to, and she'll ask me advice and she's, you know, president of, um, Shiat, right. Yeah. So I, there, I think of so many people at Droga who, if they were asked advice, um, would absolutely, you know, give advice and think about this. But to my earlier point, people give you advice based on their experience. So, you know, my experience was a, a certain way. You also figure it out on your own, yeah. right? And, you know, being somewhere, seeing what you like, what you don't like, seeing um, the environment and culture you want to be in, you know, trying out some, you know, different places, even if it's just going in to talk to people, to hear philosophy of approaches, um, will matter too. You know, you'll remember I had a conversation with X person and I liked the, you know, level of respect she gave me, even though I was like a, you know, fumbling 21 year old. That was me personally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I, I, I'll tell you one of the, the things that really, you know, stuck with me from my BBH days was, you know, Sir John Haggerty, when he used to say, do interesting things and interesting things will happen to you. Mm -hmm. And I, I always love that, you know, I just taking inspiration from the outside world and outside culture that can help sort of inform your thinking and advertising, I think was a really powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well. When, when I was um, the same, sir, you know, he was uh, the creative lead at uh, BBH New York at the time. And I was running Levi's and I was exhausted. Um, I was so, uh, you know, kind of burnt out because it was this very fast and furious account um, that BBH New York had won. There was a lot of pressure. Then after two years, I decided I was, you know, in my early thirties and I was going to take, I needed to take some time off and I took six months off and um, just traveled around and I, and they kept my job open, which was nice. Yeah. Right. So those were some lovely six months. I would highly recommend that. Um, and I remember John Haggerty saying to me, uh, listen, it's not like the best timing you run Levi's your head of account management, but you know what, you're going to come back a more interesting person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do it. We hope you come back. We'll leave your job open. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of good people um, in this, in this industry um, for, for students thinking about getting into it. When I first interviewed with David Droga, it was a very small agency. I think it was like 15 people. Um, and I had been at BBH a long time. It was like hard to leave that situation and I was a couple months pregnant and it really just looked like I had ate one too many donuts. So I don't think anybody knew. And, you know, when he went, he's like, okay, I want to talk about, you know, you coming here. My response was, okay, I have to tell you something. And he's like, ah, uh, you really always wanted to move to Brazil. I'm like, I know I'm, I'm pregnant. And his immediate response without, you know, talking to any lawyers or anyone was like, okay, well, that doesn't matter. I mean, that's good. Like we're all parents and we want the right people, you know? And I'm like, okay, I will be going on maternity leave in a few short months. And he's like, it, it doesn't matter, you know? So, um, you know, for me, that sense of integrity and, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be tough sometimes. It's not all camp, but how you treat people um, that you're going to ask a lot of, I think has, you know, kind of really been key to me. Yeah. And you see that in a lot of places. Great. Okay. A couple, couple more I'm going to go to uh, on the Q&A board. So from Lindsay Hartsfield, she said, hello, thanks for your time and corners. I'm at DNA, uh, Denver Ad School in the art, director, art Direction Program talking about networking. What's your favorite way to make new connections in the industry? Clubs, meetups, or reaching out to people directly? Um, I'm sure the clubs a creative person would tell you are actually really good things like this. Um, but I think if you can get a couple connections and people have reached out to me directly and I've just liked their 
email and I usually respond. If I'm not the right person to speak to, I send them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it may be, you know, I'm graduating in a year. Is there someone who could take a look at my book? You know, would they be willing to do that? Some places are going to send you into HR, um, but there's always great people in HR who might send you somewhere else. Um, if, if you don't have any, hey, I know someone who knows someone to kind of connect you a bit and don't be afraid to ask. I was terrified of asking anything, um, but I was a little more like afraid of my own shadow back then, you know, is if, if you have a friend who has a friend who has a connect and, you know, talking to that person and they send you to the right person. If not, I think, a, you know, reaching out to people directly, um, you know, find out a piece of work that you love and reach out to that art director and say, I loved your IHOP work. <laughs> I don't know why I hop popped into my mind, but, you know, would you be willing, I see you on the creds, would you be willing to, you know, give me some advice? Like, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think most people, um, you're going to find some responsive people, not everyone, yeah. but some. Great. Um, and, you know, what is your perspective, this is from Raina Rodenthal, what is your perspective on the shift from AOR versus utilizing specialized agencies? Um, the shift from AOR has you know, been happening forever, I feel like. And maybe because I've never really been part of a huge network that has never, uh, you know, when we were, when I started at Droga, everything was project. To me, it's still about a scope of work, what you're gonna do, what you're gonna get out of it, how you're gonna staff it, whether it's two months or six months. Um, maybe you build something longer. Most of our non-AOR, relationships grow. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're basically the same thing as an AOR. As, as far as a shift to specialized mm -hmm. agencies, I haven't, that's not, I haven't really seen that. I think most, um, maybe I'm in a bit of a bubble, but um, I think most special um, request or you know, things that you might need a real specialist for, either agencies are building to a certain extent or they have a partner whom they want to work with. You know, every huge client has multiple different agencies and it's more of an integrated agency team. I think, you know, the days of everything going to one agency when it's a really big piece of business are kind of few and far between. Um, but I think that's fine. It really comes down to, you know, the work you do and your people and, and the relationship. Um, but the project in AOR has never really bothered me because I've never really seen the difference. It's really just about a length of time. Yeah. Okay. Um, Lisa Sanders is asking, what, uh, uh, where is it? What do you think is one of the biggest challenges facing agencies today? Um, I think there's definitely, there's a need for agencies to move quicker right? And staff in different ways to get to different ideas. Um, you know, you'll talk to certain clients, especially big tech clients that they don't necessarily, you know, see the value in different layers and oversight from a, a quality perspective. You have to kind of prove it to them and show it. But, you know, I think the challenge to that whole baton passing, you know, here's the brief, go creative concept for a month. Like that's, not happening. Everything is, has to be very integrated. So really figuring out when to have people um, insert with different expertise at what time is important because there's more of a need to get to full experience ideas where you might need a UX person, design, data upfront versus, you know, after the idea is cracked. But you still need the space to get to great ideas. Creatives need space. They definitely need space. They need not to have 17 people in every meeting. Um, so it is that balance of the kind of need for speed, the need to be able to pivot and evolve, work in the moment, not you know six months later based on results. You know, creates a very different um, you know kind of collaborative model. So how do you create that model, which I think works very very well. Um, if you can get it right, but also give people the space they need. Um, so that's pro that I think that's a challenge for everyone. Cool. And I'm going to just sort of um, zoom in on that uh, baton pass suggestion you talked about, which is 
Uh, you know, I think Maddie from Denver Ads will ask a question, and I have a related question as well, which is, you know, she asked, how would you suggest um, creatives bring in account and strategy during the creative process? Building on that, I mean, you know, you have this amazing triumvirate of leadership between David Droga, Johnny Bauer, who we worked with at BBH, who runs planning at Droga, and yourself. And yeah, you know, to, to Maddie's question and just how, what is the best way to thread that needle between creative strategy and account? And, you know, I'd love to better understand on some of the, the most, you know, impactful work you've done. Like what was that, how did those roles come together? Yeah. Um, okay, so I think from a general level, there just has to be mutual respect. And I think alignment on what success looks like is really, really important. So we do these account audits, we say once a quarter, but we probably only do them twice a year, where we have the leadership across every discipline get together and say, what does success look like? It's so easy to get in your day-to-day -day client pressure, time pressure, you know, new business pressure, pulling teams and, you know, get in a bit of a rabbit hole. So if that's a saying, I think it is, but to be able to say like, listen, success is this success is a different is not, you know, we've done great TV for this client success is bringing this business problem to life in a full experience way with these different, you know, cultural moments or activations, or maybe it's a loyalty program with like a really smart brand and creative idea underpinning everything. I think if you're, you're aligned on success, then the three parties have to get together, especially, you know, at the top and say, how do we navigate and strategize for success? So that means when these six things hit us, because they will, they always do, our, this is how, you know, if we're aligned on how we do that, this is how we're going to handle it. I think where it could go wrong is if it feels like, okay, the account person is just to trying to you know, appease this client or manage to the margin. These are all things that have to happen, right? To get to happy clients, get to great work. Managing margin gets to a thriving business. Um, and people feel like the agendas are different. Um, and I think where we have done our best work, it's always been from the really, really tight core team. So, you know, I brought up IHOP, but that team is so connected our recent work that we're doing with Accenture on Kimberly Clark Huggies is you know the the um, ECD account person and strategy lead and the comms lead in data they can borderline finish each other's sentences um, and you know people like me are just sitting back watching the show and supporting them in every possible way so I think empowering the team having real clear alignment on the macro because all kinds of stuff is of course going to go wrong um, is important. And I think between me, David and Johnny, like we've, you know, we've worked together a really long time. Sometimes, you know, across the teams, across us, we may disagree. There could, but it doesn't ever feels like friction because there's so much respect. And sometimes, you know, somebody needs to push on me or I need to push on Johnny or David does. And, you know, it's the same way across the teams. I, I, I feel like there's, um, you know, there, there's a real in it together and there's a transparency, you know, our creative leads understand where our business is at um, and what things mean and why we need to, you know, have a process where you're doing a lot of check-ins or maybe you're not doing a lot of check-ins. I think um, I'm an over communicator. And I think that, you know, is a, a big part of that success. It's, it's never, you know, one group, right? Yeah. It's we're only good it's the whole package, you know, <laughs> it's all the parts. Yeah. So we have three questions that are all sort of in the same zone. So I'll, I'll kind of go through all of them. And actually very much will tee up our next uh, fireside chat about, you know, just remote working versus going back to the office. So Reese Cassart says, what role do you foresee fully remote creatives playing in a post-COVID industry? Will you continue to keep people from all over the country? Will everyone move back to the office? We'll keep going with it. They're all sort of related. Um, Molly Hennessy says, post pandemic, do you envision still offering remote work options? And if so, how would you make sure it doesn't negatively affect managing teams and building culture? And then Sarah Bailey asks, um, have, you, have you fostered, encouraged a positive collaborative, and dare I say, fun team culture while working remote? Oh, that's not a question. And I think you need glasses because you could barely see those yeah. um, things. Is So, I mean, yeah, what a year. Like, I mean, listen, we have been 
a learning as we, you know, went through this past year. At first we were over communicating. People were like back-to-back meetings, couldn't even use the bathroom or, you know, make a piece of toast. Um, but, and we've gotten much better about, you know, how do we do informal? What do you need to do in a meeting or not? So I think uh, this is my personal perspective. As a company, um, Droga5 has gotten much better about working remote. So, you know, this, as we all know, is a high burnout industry, um, high speed, client demanding. I think that's a great thing. So, you know, if people were, if someone was to say, I just need to be at home because I really need to, you know, take my daughter to dance. And if I'm commuting, it's too far, or I just need headspace, there'll be so much more flexibility. I, I mean, we were never even on like computer screens talking to each other. I mean, David Drogan and I were like the last people to be like, oh, we can't just call into this is, um, so we've gotten really much better at it, you know? Um, and I think we've had a, you know, knock on wood, pretty successful year and go um, in, in the situation and working remotely. But I also think there's a lot that you miss not being in person. So I think we'll have more flexibility to work. I don't think we'll go fully remote. Um, you know, could people live in all places? It depends on the job. I mean, Accenture lives all over, but um, that's not something I can see us doing. Our culture is really important. Um, the nuances, the connect, like the, this is an emotional job we all do. Like so many people are putting their own ideas on the line, you know, that hallway conversation, um, you know, getting inspiration from, you know, something someone did or said, or the, you know, the fun kind of like interplay we think is really important to the work we do. So I think we'll have more flexibility to work from home. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet, but we do really see a big benefit in being together. And to the question of how do you, you know, keep it, you know, connected and fun, it, it, it's hard, you know, um, we don't want to create more meetings, but we have like a whole slew of cultural things we try to do remotely from like music night to different share outs from different groups, you know, where we, a lot of speakers where people can just get out of the day to day and, you know, hear from it, some inspirational different leaders talking about things, all agency stuff. We have a toast later today about something, but it's definitely not the same. You know, I did the end of year meeting and I'm like, wow, this is not the same as being on the stairs and like going to an all agency party <laughs> afterwards. Um, so we're doing the best we can. I don't think it's perfect. Um, and, and trying to like, the most important thing I would say for anyone is like how you connect with those people who aren't the most vocal people person who may be like turning off their camera a lot and maybe not, you know, quite as engaged. I'm sure that is the case for every business. So it's taught us a lot, which is good because it gives people more balance in their life for when they do want to work from home. But um, it's also taught us that we really miss being together. Yeah. Like you, it helps remember like, oh, I really like those people. <laughs> and when you're on a computer, it doesn't uh, always, you know, you for, it's easier to forget that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of other quick ones. And I think then we'll be a few minutes before closing. Um, so what was your favorite and uh, favorite and least favorite Super Bowl ad and why? And that's from Trisha Nope. Mm. Oh my gosh. Um, favorite and least favorite. <sighs> Gosh, I can't, I don't even know if I watched all the Super Bowl ads. I wouldn't say I have a least favorite because I can't say that because I've had like so many up and down Super Bowl experiences in my career and so much goes into that. Um, as far as favorite, well, I really liked our Paramount stuff because I thought it was ridiculous and everyone needed a little ridiculous. Um, you know, there is a lot of, of different stuff that I thought was good. You know, I thought it was I mean, of course it got a little bit sticky, but I, you know, the, you had the serious like Bruce Springsteen Jeep stuff that, you know, I, I thought like just hearing from him was um, a positive thing. Um, I am like totally blanking on remembering half of the Super Bowl, which probably doesn't say much. <laughs> World ad, uh, that William Gellner worked on, which was great too. Which was it? The Wayne's World ad for Uber. Oh yeah, yeah, that was good. That was yeah. good. <laughs> um, all right. Um, do you, do you, 
because there are some questions coming in. We'll try to be. Yeah, able. yeah. I had till I've got a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. I have these like Teams things coming in. If people can hear beeping, that I'm uh, I, I can't that. figure out how to turn off. So sorry about that. Those kids come in. We're not sure whether that was going to happen or not. So you know. no. no. Um, so Gregory Martinez asks, has it helped to be a Leo in this industry? Are you a Leo? <laughs> yeah. Has has it helped to be a Leo in this industry? Greg Martinez, did you say? Yeah, Gregory Martinez. Is yeah. that from my old Goodby days? Must be. <laughs> Must know some inside information about you, but I assume it. it, I, it I, 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 I knew a Greg Martinez from my a thousand years ago in Goodby. Um, that is funny if that's him. If it is, hi. If not, hi, other Greg. Um, has it helped? Well, I'm not like a very typical Leo. So, you know, who loves that? Like I was like crawling out of my skin when Andy was doing the um, introduction. So, you know, I maybe, yes, maybe. <laughs> um, you know, Ed from Cactus is saying, I don't think I can, rec uh, I don't think I can recall a global campaign with the amount of collaboration that For the Throne and GOT was involved in. What was the biggest challenge in coordinating those before and during the launch of the final season? Um, the Game of Thrones work, did yep. you say? Yep. Yeah. Um, yes, that was like some major coordination. We are also working with Wyden. So, you know, that's a, a very interesting um, perspective. Uh, the HBO clients are work at the, I, mean, I don't know if it's the same lineup now, but it, they were incredibly visionary, um, very, very ambitious, and that helped. Um, we got the idea, you know, the, the Super Bowl spot and then all the pieces that fell out of it, the different activations, um, and just fell in love with it. So um, the agency had so much energy around it. I mean, it took multiple, multiple millions of meetings, you know, across agency. You also had InBev, right, involved with the Bud Light night. Um, and, you know, it was just a situation where it was incredibly time consuming, but um, everybody was so excited about the work mm -hmm. that, you know, we were probably pulling people in. I'm, I'm sure we, you know, I don't know what the financials look like, but we were pulling people in um, who just had a lot of passion to work on it. And it was one of those things that it was a pretty audacious idea and it just snowballed and got momentum and we rallied behind it. You know, yeah. David was very personally involved um, pushing yeah. it through, which I think made it you know, always has a really positive impact. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what it came down to. Well, three more questions. So the one from Molly Hennessy, which is what's the most important in, uh, leadership, important leadership lesson you've learned and how is it valuable? Um, important leadership. Gosh, I think um, patience, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'll go back to resilience. You know, if, if, you know, to your setup on Droga, you know, knock on wood, we have obviously had a lot of success, but, you know, I, I always say like how you lead in tough times is more important than how you lead in good times. Um, and I think maintaining that clarity, maintaining the belief in who you are as a whole. And I think the last thing I would say is really believing in the whole. Yep. Right. Because that means that it's not about you. It's not about the three people at the top. It never has been. Um, it's about, you know, a sense of pride, seeing the teams in action, um, you know, seeing the commitment and the aligned belief, um, I think is important to make it not about you um, and, and believing in the whole. And I think just knowing that you are the person that people are going to turn to when things are tricky mm -hmm. and, you know, maintaining optimism and focus and, you know, also authority, um, I, I think is important. Cool. Um, and how often do you create just for yourself? Have you noticed a change in what personal projects you gravitate towards? Um, yeah, that, that's a good point. Personal projects professionally, do you mean? <laughs> or whatever, whatever things you're passionate like, what, about. What do I really do, interestingly? Like, I think it's it's so important to create space for yourself. And I can't say that I've like been amazing at that over the years, but I think that was part of my move to Connecticut. Like I had a real 
like full circle desire to be closer to nature, you know, which is how I grew up. Um, and that's made a big difference for me. As far as projects that I gravitate for, I do now have the flexibility. We do we work on a lot of pro bonos and um, we'll continue to do so. And, you know, I have, I, I do tap into the things that I really um, care about and want to be, want to be a part of. Great. All right. Last question, which is from Caitlin Kehoe here from Denver Ad School. She said, what is your opinion on building your personal brand? Do agencies care about this during the hiring process? The internet tells us we need to be this and that on the internet to be successful. Is this true? So what, what advice would you give to this on this topic? Um, I personally don't care what people do on the internet. Um, I don't know if I'm the best person to ask. I'm, you know, not very socially active as Andy probably knows um, on, on different forums. Um, I, I think it depends on the company, but I don't, I think people want you, you to be who you are, curious, engaged, um, part of culture, you know, in this industry. I don't think it matters what you do or don't do on the internet. As far as your personal brand goes, I, you know, as you really start to move up in your career and you define what that is, that, you know, that is important. Um, not something I personally was that comfortable with, um, but that doesn't mean that it's you know, not, not important. Um, but as far as like do this and that on the internet, like, I mean, I've certainly never looked at that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, Andy, but when interviewing people, um, you know, I'm talking to a, a human being, yeah. I'm seeing what they're like, what the, will they collaborate? Are they curious? Um, you know, are they, does integrity matter? You know, are they ambitious? And, um, you know, do we want them to be part of the team is sort of as simple mm -hmm. as that. Great. Okay. Um, yeah. So we wanted to, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time um, spending with us. A couple of things that we'd love to just um, talk about. One is um, there will be a post event survey that we, you know, should take two minutes. If everyone can fill that out, um, we'd love to, you know, get better understanding of, you know, this event, future events, topics that we want to include. I think we're going to probably do a fireside chat once a month. Um, and then I wouldn't mind just teeing up the next fireside chat, which I sort of alluded to at the beginning. Um, but it's, it's called To Office or Not to Office. And the presenting sponsor of that is $11 Bill. Um, and along with Cactus, Denver Ad School, Fortnite Collective, Vladimir Jones, and TDA. And it's really a frank conversation about the pros and cons of working remotely, which obviously is something that seems very top of mind at the moment, um, based on some of the questions that have been asked. Um, the panel will be led by Lisa Fress from $11 Bill, along with um, key attendees from RGA and Baldwin and agency. So um, you can register in the chat. You can also find it on Eventbrite, but hopefully we'll get a lot of people for that. Um, and then we'll have more events coming up over the next few months. So thanks again for everyone's time. And Sarah, can't thank you enough. Have a great weekend. Yes, and thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> Absolutely. Any last thoughts or parting thoughts you want to leave with us? Oh gosh, you're in a great place, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> like from a from a work perspective, that you know, it, it seems like there's just so much creativity that has always come out of um, Denver and the whole area. Um, that yeah, I just it seems like um, a lot of good things probably a lot of great people are there that, you know, I just look forward to hearing more what comes out of that region. Great. Thanks again. Have a great weekend, everyone. Um, bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.